and welcome to another podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Harshita Gupta. Today, we'll delve into the fascinating world of thyroid health and metabolism, exploring its impact and implications beyond the surface. To guide us through this enlightening discussion, we are joined by Dr. Rahul Desai, a consultant diabetologist at Advanced Diabetes Care Center in Balsar. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Rahul. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harshita and the team of MedSynapse for giving me this opportunity again to be on the show. Thank you, Doctor. So, uh, Dr. Rahul, uh, before we dive into our discussion, I would like to touch on a few points. Uh, we know that thyroid dysfunction is a prevalent issue in today's population with various factors contributing to its prevalence. So, uh, could you shed some light on this? First of all, uh, let's discuss what is the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a small butterfly shaped gland at the base of the neck. Uh, basically produces two main hormones, the T3 and the T4. Uh, the overproduction or the underproduction of which would cause either hypothyroidism, which is the underproduction or hyperthyroidism, which is the overproduction. Now the T3 and the T4 production are again controlled by something called the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is secreted by uh, another gland called the pituitary gland located somewhere in your brain, right? Now, if the T3 and T4 secretions are higher, then the T TSH by that regard will be low. And if the T3 and T4 are lower, the TSH secretion will be slightly higher. This is the conventional state of hypo and hyperthyroidism in the body. Coming to prevalence, uh, currently in India, we have suspected 40 million pe uh, people with just hypothyroidism alone. With Andhra Pradesh and Kerala being two states, uh, in fact, even Jammu and Kashmir, these three states have a very high prevalence with as many as one in 10 people having a thyroid dysfunction. Uh, hyperthyroidism is also quite common, but con uh, at present we don't have considerable data to show for the same. And uh, one more uh, issue with prevalence is that females are three times more uh, prone to having hypothyroidism. Again, with hyperthyroidism, we don't have too much data, but with hypothyroidism, there is a three times more prevalence. Uh, now, reasons for increased prevalence could be many, but most importantly, one would be education. So there is more awareness about the gland and uh, detection of the same. Secondly, could be bad lifestyle. So erratic eating habits, uh, inadequate exercise, all of these could uh, result in a discrepant energy usage in the body. and uh, the third main reason would be autoimmunity. Now, autoimmunity is something that has been loosely studied with stress. In fact, one of the most important autoantibodies, which is the TPO antibody, uh, commonly associated with uh, hypothyroidism and in medical language called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, that is that one antibody has been strongly associated with stress recently. And further studies would validate the same, but uh, at this point in time, I think it is an important factor to consider. There, may, there may be other factors also that could affect prevalence, but currently these three would, I would say, are the most important ones. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rahul, for that insightful overview. Uh, now moving on to our next question: Stress and cortisol levels are often linked to thyroid function. So, how do these factors? affect the thyroid and what strategies can be used to manage stress related thyroid issues so cortisol is basically a stress hormone it is also a steroid hormone in the body so now every time you are under stress whether it's physical or psychological your body is going to have a response to it right and every time you have a response to it there is an increase in the level of cortisol now cortisol levels are directly proportional to uh, your TSH level. So when the cortisol level goes up, your TSH levels go down. And when the TSH levels go down, the production of thyroid is at a lower rate than usual. So higher level of cortisol and uh, stress are linked to uh, hypothyroidism. In fact, the anti-TPO antibody that I was uh, talking about before also, that is also linked to hypothyroidism. So stress is quite heavily linked with hypothyroidism alone more than hyperthyroidism uh, but again could cause either and uh, now that we know that stress causes that what can be done to avoid this situation so the best cure is the prevention of the 
uh, causative agent itself now one of the things that we have in our own backyard is yoga which is our best and worst kept secret now yoga works wonders when it comes to stress and uh, there are certain yoga that also they say that they also help with the uh, functioning of your thyroid hormone because uh, they believe that since thyroid hormone is linked with energy utilization and metabolism when you control your breathing patterns or respiration there could be some effect to that as well uh, the other thing that you can try is meditation uh, most importantly what you can also do is eat a balanced diet make sure that you are incorporating a lot of minerals in your uh, diet uh, second thing you what you can do is use iodized salt but again i would like to uh, be very clear that you don't have to eat in ex- excess but in moderation i would you instead of using normal salt you can use an iodized salt and uh, one other thing that uh, my mentor you would always uh, tell his patients uh, was do a digital detox so a digital detox is basically one hour before you sleep you have no screen time you put your phones away you turn off your tv you can probably read a book you can uh, listen to music uh, or you can talk to someone but avoid any screen time before you go to bed so digital detox i think in the next few years is going to take center stage in stress management as well yeah great insights dr rahul and now moving on how does thyroid dysfunction impact fertility and reproductive health so now the association between uh, thyroid dysfunction and fertility is not something new uh, both are very very closely related to each other especially because thyroid dysfunction can cause ovulatory disturbances as well uh, now let's separate the female and the male reproductive system so when it comes to female females uh, thyroid dysfunction could cause lower levels of fsh and lh which can cause uh, you know erratic periods and uh, abnormal uh, bleeding during periods so all of that could re- result in you know you being unable to conceive properly or unable to time your conception period properly uh, when it comes to males uh, thyroid dysfunction is loosely related to th- testosterone levels but newer studies are suggesting that a hypothyroid person would have lower levels of testosterone as well uh but this is again a very loose association at this moment uh, further evaluation would be required uh not just during the conception phase but also in the pregnancy phase the thyroid function is extremely important because what happens is that in the early phases of uh, child development uh, or fetal development rather uh the baby doesn't have a thyroid hormone or a thyroid uh, gland of its own so it is completely depend on on the mother's thyroid hormones more importantly the tsh which freely crosses the placenta placental barrier so in that phase also you have to maintain a tsh level of less than 2.5 otherwise there is a chance of not only miscarriages but also of uh, uh, birth defects in kids because tsh hormone that freely crosses the placental barrier is very strongly associated with organogenesis or the formation of organs in the baby so not just with fertility but also during the uh, pregnancy phase we have to make sure that the thyroid dysfunction is tackled yeah thank you dr rahul for clarifying that now considering the complexity of thyroid function how do other medical conditions like diabetes or hormonal imbalances intersect with uh, thyroid function and how should these be managed concurrently so now uh, first of all let's talk about diabetes and thyroid Uh, these two disorders are known to coexist and uh, they co- concurrently occur in many many patients uh, in fact there are many studies that say that hypothyroidism and type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes in some cases are closely linked to each other especially because both of these are very metabolic in nature or at least affect metabolism in some form or the other now thyroid when we talk about thyroid it uh it is a gland that it it is an hormone that affects the utilization of energy and affects your metabolic rate whereas uh, diabetes is a metabolic condition that affects the level of glucose in the body so uh, inherently uh, the pathways through which these two act or uh, they occur are maybe not very similar but they have certain common pathways where they would intersect 
and now one common pathway where they intersect is the level of cholesterol in diabetes levels of cholesterol are higher which causes insulin resistance in thyroid as well increases uh, there is an increase in a free fatty acid synthesis which again causes insulin resistance so someone with thyroid would be more prone to getting diabetes in the future whereas someone with diabetes would be more prone to getting hypothyroidism in the future this is only with hypothyroidism what i'm talking about now not just hypothyroidism but even hyperthyroidism is very closely linked with uh, diabetes one of the most common forms of hyperthyroidism which is the graves disease uh so that is very closely linked to type 1 diabetes and not type 2 which is commonly seen in obese patients the type 1 uh, diabetes is where the autoimmunity kills your beta cells and makes your body unable to produce uh, adequate insulin to counter your glucose levels now that is very closely linked to not only hashimotos thyroiditis but also with graves disease which is one of the very common reasons for not only hyperthyroidism but eventually that will lead to hyperthyroidism as well now uh, what we have to uh, see is that other hormones are also being affected by thyroid because thyroid not only controls your energy utilization and metabolism but is also responsible for the proper functioning of all hormones in your body or at least most of them not all but at least most of them so like we discussed lh and fsh in females are very strongly linked to thyroid function testosterone in males loosely associated with thyroid function cortisol we've discussed before that a higher level of cortisol would uh, result in lower levels of tsh and, and therefore cause hypothyroidism uh, beyond these uh, very few hormones are being affected by thyroid directly but indirectly almost all of your endocrine function is either governed by or governed through your thyroid function thank you for highlighting the interconnected nature of these conditions dr rahul uh, now what are some common misconceptions about thyroid health uh, that's a really good one dr harshita because we could do an entire podcast on misconceptions with thyroid health but uh, to uh, name a few one of the most common uh, misconceptions that we get from the patients is whether eating more of iodized salt is going to solve my problem so no it is not going to solve your problem because increased iodine intake can be counterproductive in the sense that it could also eventually cause hypothyroidism right so in very high levels of iodine will also cause a counterproductive effect on the body in fact your symptoms could worsen so everything has to be done in moderation with either a consultation with your dietitian nutritionist or your uh, concerned doctor the second one that uh, we get very commonly is that i am a man how did i get thyroid disease uh, or thyroid dysfunction but that is completely uh incorrect because men are also prone to getting thyroid dysfunction although less than females uh but the prevalence in females like i said before is three times as much as men but men could also get it so that is one other bit that i would break then uh, third thing which is also very common is that uh, i'm losing weight how could i have thyroid uh, or thyroid dysfunction so now hyperthyroidism is a state where your energy utilization is much higher your metabolic rate is much higher so you would probably be losing weight rather than gaining so there are two forms of uh, of thyroidism that we have to understand hypothyroidism where you are going to conventionally gain weight and the other is hyperthyroidism where you are supposed to lose weight so ener- uh, so the net total of your weight is going to be dependent on your energy utilization and metabolism which could go either way with thyroid dysfunction in fact uh, i have also heard that i am a very young person i'm 20 25 and how did i uh, get thyroid dysfunction so uh, when i was studying i remember that uh, the ideal not the ideal age uh, there is no ideal age to get it but uh, the most common ages where you would uh, get detected with thyroidism was maybe in your late 30s or early 40s but now all diseases have come a decade earlier and people in their 20s could also get it right so there is no age bar for getting a thyroid dysfunction or a thyroid disorder and in fact for hyperthyroidism again i'm coming back to hyperthyroidism because it is something that we don't really focus on too much so hyperthyroidism is most common in people between the ages of 20 and 40 in fact hyperthyroidism if we do a census it could 
be possible that men and women are affected equally in fact men could be more severely affected we have no idea because we as, as it stands we don't have considerable amount of evidence or uh, population data to support the same and the last one and which i have seen a lot of doctors also uh, do this is give uh, food supplements or supplements in forms of tablets to counter your hi- uh, hypothyroidism mostly hypothyroidism here hypothyroidism is uh, slightly uh, uncommon in this case but with hypothyroidism i've seen that uh, people say eat this eat more of this eat more of that but all of this is only going to supplement your basic thyroid medication it is not a cure or it is not the first line of management on on the contrary i have also heard people say don't eat cabbage don't eat cauliflower don't eat broccoli don't eat shellfish now you will have to eat truck loads of cabbage to actually have any impact on your thyroid gland so the thing is you have to do everything in moderation you can have cabbage once a week you will have the problem is going to be when you are going to have raw cabbage in salads every day of the week that of course i will say don't do that but if you are doing it once a week twice a week cook cabbage that is almost always okay right so we have to understand where the science is and uh, where the science is absent and then take the path that is more scientific right yeah. so yeah there are various other misconceptions also but for now we will stick to these yes correct uh, dr rahul it's, it's essential to debunk the myths uh so now finally before we wrap up uh, is there any key takeaway message that you would like to leave for our audience with so now i don't have a thyroid condition so why would i think about it or when would i think about it why is because it's a silent disease in the early stages of of its uh, natural history or natural progression so you have to be mindful of it you don't have to constantly think about it but you have to be mindful of it and when do you get it checked so you either get it checked if you have unnatural weight gain if you have unnatural weight loss if there is a swelling in in your neck if you have a strong family history if your eating habits are slightly erratic if you have a very lazy lifestyle if you have mood changes irritability all of these factors could be because of thyroid i'm not saying they are always because of thyroid but they could be because of thyroid so you have to be mindful of it and uh, a proper diagnosis and treatment for both types of thyroid dysfunctions is necessary lifestyle modifications will help for sure but there is no substitute to medical management or treatment of that condition as such so what you have to do is you have to go to your doctor whoever uh, your concerned doctor is you have to seek their help and you can manage that, uh, thyroid very easily thyroid is not something that is very difficult to manage as such right as long as you can keep your thyroid uh, hormones in check you will probably not have most symptoms of thyroid dysfunction so, and uh, one other key takeaway message that i would like to share is uh, have as low sugar especially processed sugar uh process food avoid as much as possible keep a very healthy lifestyle uh work out if you can't work out go for a walk go for a brisk walk right Can don't I- don't go for a yeah, don't go for a walk in the park because that is going to be very leisurely so you have to walk at a brisk rate be fit stay fit as long as you're fit your energy utilization and metabolism the body is going to set that tone by itself you won't have to you know really work hard for it but yeah staying fit i think is the most uh, important take away from this yes totally agree dr rahul and thank you for shedding light on these important aspects of thyroid health i'm sure the audience has gained a deeper understanding of thyroid health and its implications and it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast again thank you thank you so much dr harshita and uh, hopefully we can do this again in the future yes definitely dr and uh, to our audience we hope uh, you found this discussion informative and enlightening and if you are a healthcare professional and have any questions or would like to explore more topics in the world of medicine don't forget to connect with us on our medsanaps platform 
Medsynapse platform is not just a resource, it's a dynamic space where you can connect with medical peers, participate in meaningful discussions and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. So stay tuned for more engaging conversations on health and wellness. Until next time, take care and stay healthy.